I am uh, very blessed still to have uh, living parents. Uh, my, my parents are in their early 80s and uh, still uh, firing on all cylinders. Their brains are sharper than ever. And uh, it's really, I uh, enjoy uh, talking to them, enjoy being with them. Uh, I really am blessed to have the parents that I have. I was having a very sweet conversation with my, my father uh, earlier this year. Uh, and uh, he was sharing with me how his, his position, his opinion on uh, the issue of the death penalty for criminals, those who've committed heinous crimes, his perspective on that uh, has changed. And uh, we were eating breakfast together, and he just wanted to tell me that. Uh, we were talking about um, that particular uh, uh, conviction or our belief system in terms of, of what should be done with those who commit terrible crimes of murder and other things. My father has... Uh, uh, I think uh, reluctantly and cautiously supported the death penalty for those kinds of criminals uh, most of his life um, until several years ago uh, when he started visiting and uh, just loving he, people who were in prison, prisoners. He goes to prison uh, once or twice every single week of his life, uh, not to be incarcerated, but to, to uh, not because he's on probation either. Uh, he, he goes there to actually just spend some time with, uh, with prisoners and share Christ with them. And, and he said this to me over breakfast with tears. He said, you know, he said, Brian, I have actually changed my position on the death penalty for criminals. He said, because um, confronted with reality, confronted with their faces, confronted with uh, knowing them, seeing them face to face, and also realizing that uh, the death penalty basically um, stops the possibility of them ever hearing the gospel. Uh, if they've not heard the gospel yet, if they've not decided to follow Jesus Christ and the death penalty is actually awarded, then they, they miss the chance to actually uh, choose to follow Jesus. And uh, my dad said, you know, I just I cannot support the death penalty anymore because it removes uh, the option for them to hear the gospel and to be transformed. And so I've changed my, my position. He said this with tears. I, I was listening to him just thinking, wow, this man's in his 80s and still learning, still willing to uh, look at life from a different lens, from a different perspective. And, and I, I also realized that for him, confronted with reality, confronted with uh, the desperation in the faces of the people that he was falling in love with, and who, those who was loving in Jesus' name in these prisons, uh, he realized that his position was faulty. Often, um, when we are confronted with reality, when we see life face to face, when we're confronted with desperation, we, the, the gaps in our doctrine, the gaps in our thinking are revealed, they're exposed. And we realize, wait a minute, I, I, was, I was thinking and moving in the wrong direction. Often where love has been uh, removed uh, from our perspective, when love is not really a, uh, a, uh, a part of our thinking and our rationale and our logic, uh, we very often come to wrong conclusions about how people should be dealt with. Uh, when you throw in the reality of a face, throw in the reality of love, throw in the reality of hope and God's plan for mankind, uh, you begin to see the gaps in our, our, our doctrine, the gaps in our thinking. Desperation moves us to very often to, to seek out Jesus when maybe we were not ever willing to before. Uh, and we, we see that God actually does love us, that he is real. Uh, and very often we only see that in moments where reality hits us in the face. Whether it's desperation or crisis, uh, it's then that we realize, wait a minute, the way I've been living and thinking my whole life is actually off. This morning, um, I want to share you, with you a story that's in, in the book of John, John chapter 4. It's a very short story of a man who was desperate, and uh, so he ran to Jesus for help. Um, not just any man, an interesting man, uh, John 4, verses 46 through 54, uh, it's on the screen here. A nobleman, uh, an aristocrat, uh, someone who probably would have never thought to need Jesus until his son was about to die. A man who thought, no, this, this carpenter uh, is not really someone that I really need to hang out with or spend time with. It probably was the owner of, of, of a big house, owner of a lot of stuff, uh, a big family, uh, very well known, a nobleman, uh, you know, connected in government, uh, a popular man, someone who was a star uh, in his culture and in his world. Uh, his son uh, gets very ill and is on the verge of death, and then he becomes desperate. Then uh, the Bible tells us that actually he was sent um, to, 
uh, we think possibly, the Bible doesn't tell us, we think possibly by his wife. I, I'm, I'm just guessing here. Andy Stanley talks about this passage and, and creates this whole scenario of how the wife is, you know, panicky and sends, <laughs> sends her husband off. You get Jesus right now and you get him here. Um, <laughs> now, we don't know. It's not in the Bible. But you can just imagine uh, the desperation uh, if you're a mother or if you're a father and your, your child is about to die, what would you do? Um, you might consider all kinds of other doctrine, and you might actually go to the ends of the earth to find a cure for your child. This is what this nobleman is doing. He, uh, he's in Capernaum, and uh, he hears that Jesus is back in Cana, where he had changed, by the way. He had changed the water into wine. You remember that story? That's in John chapter 2. That had already happened, and so his fame was, was just multiplying. By the way, Capernaum uh, was, was quite a few kilometers away from Cana, and uh, so it was, it was about a day's walk uh, if you were coming in, uh, maybe about 50 kilometers or so, and we don't know if he, if, he, if he rode his chariot there. We don't know if he walked there, but he desperately went to find Jesus, and we know that it took him a day to get there because it took him a day to get back. He says, please, my son is on the point of death please. Jesus makes this statement, and look in verse 48 here, he says this, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. This is an interesting statement. I want to park here just for a second, and, and let's look at that for a moment. Now, from our perspective, uh, from our perspective of, of um, maybe uh, living in a world of sarcasm and, and uh, negativity, we might read this in a negative way, like Jesus was being sarcastic and rude. Uh, you know, unless, you, unless I do a miracle for you, you're not going to believe. You could, you could read it that way, right? And many of us, when we read this scripture, this is what we think. This is the first thing that comes to our mind, right? It, it, it's at least what the first thing that came to my mind was sort of an exasperated Jesus, uh, you know, who's saying, oh, good grief. And, and we have actually cause for thinking this because later in Scripture, in John chapter 8 and following, he actually is frustrated with people because all they want to do is see a sign. And he says, no more signs for you because, you know, it's not working, basically. Here, I, I believe his attitude is uh, just stating facts. You know, unless you see a sign, unless you see a wonder, you're not going to believe because we see his action later, he says to the nobleman in verse 49, he says, Sir, come down before my child. The, the, the nobleman's desperation says, Sir, please come down before my son dies. Verse 50, Jesus says, Go your way. Your son lives. In other words, I, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to do a miracle so that you will believe. I believe this is the heart and the attitude of Jesus in this text. Is that I'm going to do a miracle for you so that you can believe. Desperation of a man. Did not go back with him. I love how some pastors preach on this topic. Is again, they 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 pick on the wife who they think is back at the house, uh, <laughs> desperate and irritated, you, and, and waiting for the husband to come back. And imagine, husband comes back without Jesus. Um, where is Jesus? I sent you with one job. Go get Jesus. Bring him back. Don't you know our son is dying? I, this is not in the Bible. Um, we're just you know thinking what could be. This man is asked by Jesus to go home without him and to trust him. The Bible tells us that he trusted that the word that Jesus spoke was going to actually impact his son. In incredible story. As you see in the text, uh, the nobleman uh, makes his way back. And, and before he gets home, uh, servants from his house meet him halfway and say, Your son is well. And as they have this conversation about when it took place, they determined that at the exact hour, the exact moment that Jesus said your son will live is the moment that his son started uh, recovering. That was the beginning of his, his healing. And then, and then this nobleman believed in Jesus. And not just him, but his whole family, his whole household decided to follow Jesus to believe in him. You see, two phases of belief. Phase one, yes, Jesus, I believe you can do this miracle. Phase two, I believe in you and I will follow you. This is what happened in this story. John writes uh, towards the end of this passage, he says in verse 54, this again is the second sign Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. Now we know that John is writing this story uh, from 
Uh, he says in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he says, The reason why I've given you all these miracles and signs is so that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing in him, you will have life. That's the reason why John wrote the book of John, is so that with these miracles and signs, we would be convinced that we would be moved and, and, and believe that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God and by believing in him, we would have life in his name. This story is such an incredible illustration uh, this true story of this nobleman's son who, by, by, by meeting and, and being confronted by Jesus, by having contact with Jesus, the Spirit of God, he's transformed. He discovers life. He is removed from death to life. And uh, there's hope in this family for the first time. Incredible. I love this story. And as I look at this story, the reason why I love it so much is because it's, it's so different than what we usually see Jesus doing. Uh, we usually see Jesus in having human contact with the people that he's healing. Uh, over and over again, he's actually leaning over the girl who's just who's been dead for three or four days. He's, he's actually um, uh, touching people who are ill. It's the, the lady who had the issue of blood who, who went through the crowds and pushed her way through and grabbed onto his tunic so that she could be healed of her, of her blood, uh, being an issue of blood and her, her, her sickness. And it was that touch. Uh, that instantly in her faith, that actually she was healed. So we see Jesus actually having face-to-face -face physical contact with people in order for them to be healed. In this, in this context, you see that uh, this boy, so many kilometers away from Jesus, but is transformed by Jesus who is so far away. But is he really far away? What does this story reveal to us? Only that Christ is everywhere, right? The, we see the omniscience and omnipotence of God. We see that he's everywhere all the time and he's, he's all power. his power is forever and over all. That with a spoken word from a long distance away, a boy is healed. Incredible. He transcends natural law. He reverses a downward spiral to death with only a word. He did not have to be present or touch the boy. He just spoke from a distance and this child is well. It's incredible. I think of how comforting that must have been to this family. But, but for you and for me today, how comforting this must be for us. Because we don't see Jesus. We don't have the capacity with our eyes to actually see the living God who is with us. He's here. But we can't see him. And so we are asked to trust in what we cannot see. Like this nobleman, we are asked to have that kind of faith. The kind of faith that, <laughs> that is in one we cannot see with our eyes. And we so often get lost in this realm of what we can see with our eyes. Instead of allowing ourselves to be open to the realm that we cannot see with our eyes. That is real and exists. This morning, all of us who are sitting upright and sitting alive, eyes open, have hearts that are beating, hearts that you have hopefully never seen in your hand or you know, outside of your body. Uh, these hearts are giving you life, pumping consistently. You feel it, but you've never seen your heart. I think most of us in this room as well have brains that we've never actually seen. I say most of us, probably... All of us. We have brains that, that direct our body, and we've, we've never seen them. Now, science has given us the opportunity to actually visualize brain activity. We can do scans. We can see where uh, zones of the brain that are more active than others because of technology, but can't see it with our eyes. So, And we live in a world where everything that we breathe is something that we can't see. And isn't that great? I, I really appreciate that, that God decided for air to be clear. Um, can you just imagine if air wasn't clear, that we could see it all the time? You could see oxygen coming in and, you know, carbon dioxide going out. Wouldn't that be interesting? That would be pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> what if you could see people's bad breath? You know, not good. Not good. Smelling is good enough. We know it's there. We are invited by God to actually um, see with spiritual eyes. We're invited to see in a, in a dimension and a realm that we cannot see with our eyes. 
And, and this really is the invitation of God to the nobleman. The invitation to you and me is that we would actually see with eyes that are spiritual, that are deeper than, than, than this. I really believe that the, probably the greatest, um, the greatest weakness in arguments that depend solely on science or on the observable is that it, it totally shuts out a spiritual dimension that cannot be uh, illustrated or proven in a laboratory. And so we, we cut off a whole section of reality in making and coming to our conclusions. We are invited, I believe, in this text to, to allow ourselves to think beyond the laboratory, to think beyond what we can logically explain, what we can logically see with our own eyes, what can logically be proved by the existing uh, wealth of scientific knowledge that we have today. But that to go beyond that, to, to see a dimension that is beyond that. This is the invitation of Jesus Christ to us to believe because of a reality that we cannot yet prove in the laboratory. This is the invitation that he gives us. We worship an unseen God. Think about that for a moment. We have faith in one we cannot see with our eyes. It shouldn't be too bizarre to us. When, again, we think about the heart, the brain, the the air we breathe, all these things that we don't see but we actually know are real and exist. Is it possible that, that science has not caught up with all that's out there yet? Is it possible that we're making conclusions, drawing conclusions based on incomplete work and that God is asking us, inviting us, I think, through this story to say, look, let's look at a different dimension. In our desperation, very often we see those gaps. We see those gaps in our, in, our, in, our, in, our prob- in our thinking, in the way we operate. I love John chapter 20 when Thomas came and uh, Jesus appeared after the, after the resurrection. And Thomas wanted to fill his hands. He said, Unless I put my fingers in the hole where he was, I will not believe. And what did Jesus say to him? Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Church, blessed are you because you have not seen and yet you believe. Wow. This is the invitation of God to walk and believe in the unseen. And it's for all of us. We are the nobleman. We are the man who goes home without the walking physical Jesus. Right? And when we step into our houses and we talk to our families, and we confront desperation, whether it's at the workplace, in our homes, or at school, whatever it is where you find crisis or desperation, we are invited by God to trust the unseen God in that moment. He invites us to trust the unseen, to believe in Him. 1 Peter 1, I love this. I love this, this affirmation of, of Peter to, uh, to those he was writing to. This is what he says, 1 Peter 1, verse 8. I love this. Such an incredible affirmation of their faith. He says this, You love him even though you have never seen him. This is verse 8 of 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, 8. Though you do not see him, now you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. You believe even though you haven't seen. You Trust Him and you rejoice and you have an inexpressible joy even though you've never seen this one that you believe in. That's incredible. Church, this is the invitation to us. We are invited today to actually trust in one we cannot see, to allow ourselves to be open to another dimension that cannot be quantified with our eyes, that cannot even be quantified with touch. Not even, none of our senses except for this spiritual dimension that we're invited to experience. We're, we're, we're invited to tap into a reality that cannot be proven in the laboratory. One atheist who converted to, to Christianity called it alchemy. Alchemy, this idea of, of the bizarre, the mysterious. Alchemy was this idea of these old philosophers of the old days who were trying to convert lead into gold. And these other different types of, of uh, mysterious liquids that would, elixirs that would actually uh, give you joy or, or heal your diseases. They would work tirelessly in their science laboratories to try to figure out something mysterious that would, that would defy natural law, that would defy reality. Jesus Christ 
the creator of the universe, defies reality over and over and over again. And he invites us to come and be transformed by him. But to do so, we have to tap into a sense that possibly we have just pushed aside and ignored. And, and we understand this, right? Sometimes our emotions are, are, are frightening to ourselves, right? Sometimes we feel things that we don't want to acknowledge. Sometimes we feel something that actually points to a guy, that points to a savior. When we see a sunrise, we want to cry. Or when we see a sunset, we rejoice. It's like, wow, that's beautiful. And we don't know what that feeling is, and it's kind of frightening. We're challenged in our world today to actually limit ourselves to what we can understand and quantify and see and think through instead of the emotions. Why do we weep at a beautiful sonnet? Why, do we, why are we moved with this inexpressible joy when we hear a certain tune or a music that is just inexpressible? Why, why, when I look at my wife when in moments of, of, of crisis, we're looking at each other and we go, I just love you so much. What, what is that? What is that? It's not something you can actually quantify in a laboratory, but it's real. And it's that love and that connection with, with me and my wife that has made us last. We stick together for something that cannot be proved in the laboratory, and it's real. That's what every marriage is, right? People come together. You ask, I do a lot of premarital counseling. You ask people, why are you getting married? I don't know. I've had guys look at their, their fiancés and go, well, just look at her. <laughs> yeah. Most of the time when it comes to people who are getting married, they'll go, it just one day, you know, I just knew that she was the one. Yeah. You mean you didn't do like a personality test inventory? You, you didn't get your blood tested in a laboratory to figure out if you were a perfect match? Uh, you didn't go online and look at your, you know, your intelligence scores. No, no, no. It just, just happened. And it's real. And over and over again, this thing that is so powerful, that cannot be described or quantified in a laboratory, is real and keeps people together. We're invited. I invite you this morning, if you struggle with believing in an unseen God, I invite you to tap into this other dimension that is there. All of us are born with a conscience. We know um, from early on what's fair and what's not fair. You know, you know, babies actually would never cry if they didn't have a standard to compare their life to. You think about it. How does a child know that they're uncomfortable and cry? Or how does a child... You know, at a young age, maybe at, at, at age one, actually look at you with a look that says, what you're doing to me is not fair. <laughs> they, they've, not been, they've not been impacted by their society and their culture around them to make them actually have a conscience. Uh, they were born with this, I know this is wrong and this is right. C.S. Lewis, in um, his writing, uh, says this. He says, human beings all over the earth, have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and cannot really get rid of it. Secondly, that they do not, in fact, believe in that way. They know the law of nature, and they break it. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. C.S. Lewis, an atheist, who after doing the math, after researching, after reading, after studying, he concluded that there is a God, and he followed God because he could not undo the reality that we have this, this inborn conscience that we, that we compare everything else to. I encourage you to think outside of, you know, even if you are an atheist this morning, why do you have frustrations with those who actually are theists? You have something you're comparing your system of justice to. Somehow in your mind, they're wrong for whatever reason. There is a standard that you're comparing others to. I invite you this morning to think outside of it and to think that, that actually the very conscience that helps you to have an opinion about what you believe in is the very thing that was given to you by living God. 
we're invited to tap into this other realm, this other world of, of understanding that there is a world. This is what Blaise Pascal said, famous French thinker and inventor. He says this, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the Creator made known through Jesus. Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, most of us can tell a story of this longing inside of us, this missing piece that was completely satisfied by Jesus. We describe it that way, and it, and it, it sounds crazy to people who've never done this before. I said, yeah, I had this emptiness in my soul. I know it's not, it can't be quantified. It's kind of bizarre. I had this emptiness, but... When I decided to place faith in Jesus Christ, this emptiness was filled, and my life now has meaning. I have an inexpressible joy. I used to be uh, sad. Now I experience joy. My life has been changed. That emptiness inside, that gap has been filled by Jesus. We're invited to respond to this longing. Our Creator inviting us to Himself, living God inviting us to Himself. That longing you may feel or you have felt before and maybe you've pushed away is the Lord God asking you, inviting you to have your emptiness filled, the gaps filled in by the living creator, a God who does exist and who has made a way for you and for me to actually have salvation, to have eternal life in his name. He invites us to believe that Jesus Christ is truly the son of God and that by believing in him, we might have life. Uh, I've enjoyed reading uh, a testimony of Nicole Cliff. Uh, she uh, is from Utah, and um, she writes in a magazine article. I want to read this to you, just portions of it here. It's incredible. She says, I became a Christian on July the 7th, 2015, after a very pleasant adult life of firm atheism. I have found myself telling this story when people ask me about it, slightly tweaked for my audience, of course, when talking to non-theists. I do a lot of shrugging and crazy, right? Nothing has changed, though. When talking to other Christians, it's more, uh, more, obviously it's been very beautiful, and I'm utterly changed by it, but the story has gotten a little away from me in the telling. She goes on to talk about how she was an atheist since she was in, in university, and that she was raised by an atheist father, a very nice man. She describes him as this incredible, kind man who was a very moral person, um, and as she talks about how snarky she was about people who actually believed. Uh, in Jesus, but that as she grew and before she came to faith, she began to be just tolerant of them. She sort of settled into this phase of, isn't it sweet that people who have faith have faith? This was her way of thinking. I think that's really nice of them that they actually can have faith. That's wonderful. This is what she settled into. But then she was confronted with life. She was confronted with a moment of desperation. She describes how her child was very, very ill. And they could not get their child well. And so she talks about how, as an atheist, she walked into her bedroom uh, where the child was. <laughs> and she, she just voiced, if you're out there, please take care of my child. And then she felt guilty for actually calling out to a God she didn't believe in. She says that was her starting point, though, to believe was that she realized that in a moment of desperation that there were gaps in the way she was thinking. She said the next thing was that uh, she began to read uh, Christian books, books written by Christian authors, because she was um, a, an editor for a magazine where they edited religion and other aspects of, of religious life. That was what she did for a living. And so she read a few Christian books to, for her research. And <laughs> she would read a book and, about Jesus and start crying. But she was intrigued, and she wanted to read another book. So she would put, get another book and read it, and she would cry. She describes, she says this, A few minutes into reading this piece, I burst into tears. I burst into tears again, and the next day, while brushing my teeth, while falling asleep, while in the shower, while feeding my kids, I burst into tears. I should say here I'm happy, even killed, even killed. So it was there that, in other words, she goes on to say that uh, she's just this very even kind of a person, but she just continued to cry. She kept reading Christian books, though, and then she said, I just kept crying, and it was getting out of hand. Just, you just can't go around crying all the time. This is where she came to. But it was this tapping into this other realm that wasn't logical. She goes on to say here that actually she would have never been convinced with apologetics. 
She would have never been, con she would have never been convinced by, by someone reasoning with her that it was this spiritual tapping into her soul. As she describes it as that someone actually tapped her, tapped her soul. And that that's why she actually decided to believe in Jesus. And then everything made sense. She talks about how that now she goes to these bizarre worship services with crazy Christians who... She makes a statement. So, you know, Christians, you know, if you ask them about Jesus, they're going to tell you about Jesus. I said, how crazy is that? Her story is that, you know, God touched me and touched a place that was outside of the realm of my logic, outside of the realm of my thinking, and changed my life. She very boldly and joyfully tells her story that Jesus pulled her out of a, a, an atheistic belief and has changed her life. This story is repeated over and over and over again by people who actually did not believe but were confronted with the living God who pulled a string to himself, to their soul, and pulled them to himself. And that's why they believed. And that's why they were changed. Russian author and intellectual Mark Inkowski spoke about his relationship with the Lord. He said that an inexpressible joy brightened my soul. D.L. Moody, the American evangelist, talks about his salvation. He says, I thought the old sun shone a good deal brighter than it ever had before. I thought that it was just smiling upon me. And as I walked out upon Boston Common and heard the birds sing in the trees, I thought they were all singing a song to me. He says, do you know I fell in love with the birds? I had never cared for them before. It seemed to me that I was in love with all creation. This is his expression of when he came to faith, the transformation of his soul. Jonathan Edwards says this. He says, the appearance of everything was altered. There seemed to be, as it were, a calm, a sweet cast of, or appearance of divine glory in almost everything. God's excellence, His wisdom, His purity, and love seemed to appear in everything, in the sun, the moon, the stars, and the clouds, and blue sky, and the grass, the flowers, the trees, and the water, and all of nature. Jesus truly transforms our soul. And He invites us to tap into that side of life that cannot be quantified in a laboratory cannot be seen with our eyes, and he invites us to have an encounter with living God. Jesus invites you this morning. If you have never placed faith in him, Jesus invites you. If you have placed faith in Jesus, he invites you to reignite your fire, to reignite your thinking, that you would understand that the reality of God, the living God is here, and that you would trust him to be everywhere all the time. And that his solutions would be part of your lifestyle. He asks you to follow him more deeply. He asks you to discover the greatness of who he is. This unseen God who is everywhere. Let's stand together.